Well, what makes a good witness for Jesus? But what makes a, a faithful gospel minister? As, as a pastor, I have a unique kind of vantage point on helping people think through this because if you, if you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a witness. You are a minister of, of the gospel. But I think anybody who is that, even somebody who's in, in my position, we, we wonder, what, is it, what does it mean to do that well? What, what's it mean to be, to be faithful in that task? And there, sometimes we can feel a lot of pressure, right? We feel like, well, we have to we have to know all of the, the answers to all of the questions that somebody might, might come up with. Or maybe we need to be experts on all world religions. Or maybe we need to, to have more experiences to be able to speak to the different nuances of, of things that people struggle with. We can feel those sorts of pressures. And, and there certainly are ways that we can grow over time in some of those areas to be able to be all the more faithful in our witnessing and ministering the gospel. I think when you look at the scriptures, you see it's really pretty simple. That the job of a, a gospel witness or a, a minister on the behalf of, of Christ is, is you gotta know who you are, you gotta know who you aren't, but ultimately you've got to know who he is. And you point to him and you say, I don't have all the answers, but I know the one who does. I, I don't have it all together, but I know the one who does. And his name is Jesus, the Lamb of God the giver of the Spirit of God, and the very Son of God. There's really nobody in all of Scripture who does that so well, like John the Baptist. As we come to John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34, John the Apostle is going to reintroduce us to, to John the Baptist. If you are here last week, as we looked at verses 1 through 18, we saw John the Apostle showing us that Jesus is the Word made flesh. He's God in a body. God came among us to show who He is by sending His Son, God the Son, uh, among us. And that there was a witness that was uh, mentioned last week, another John, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. This, this guy, John, and if you look back at 1.16, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Well, our text this morning gives us more information on John the Baptist, who I affectionately call JTB. So JTB, John the Baptist, we're going to see two days to, uh, in his early ministry that I think we find a model for our own ministries. If you want to summarize what I think we, we see about what it means to be a faithful witness for Jesus, it would simply be this. Witness for Jesus by magnifying Jesus. Witness for Jesus by magnifying Jesus. We're going to unpack this in kind of two movements. The first is going to be verses 19 through 28 where we're going to see John witness with humble boldness. We're to witness with humble boldness. We, we know who we aren't, and then we know who we are. And then we're going to see verses 19, or 29 through 34 magnify the person of Jesus. That what John does is he, he steps back and says, all eyes not on me, but all eyes on him. And let me tell you who he is. So witness for Jesus by magnifying Jesus. Let's begin here in verses 19, uh, in verse 19, witness with humble boldness. This is the testimony of John. This is, again, John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, verse 25, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, 
the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, John the Apostle starts his introduction of John the Baptist a a little bit later than a lot of the other gospel writers. The other gospel writers fill in some details. You'll remember that John the Baptist was born to a a barren woman named Elizabeth who was married to a high priest named Zechariah. And in Luke chapter 1, a prophecy was given to Zechariah uh, about this child who's going to be born to them. He will be great before the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go in the spirit and the power of Elijah to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. This prophecy about John the Baptist was given before he was even born. And then when he was born, there was such a stir in Israel. It says that that all these things about who this John the Baptist was and was going to be, all these things were talked about through, through Judea. And all laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So John the Baptist, at least at the time of his birth, would have been, would have been a, a known commodity. They would have known about this guy. They would have known that something special about him and about his life and what he was going to do was, was going to happen. But then he goes off the scene. And we don't see anything about him until this part of his ministry where he steps back on the scene and he begins to call the nation of Israel to repent. So that's John the Baptist. We also meet here some other characters, the, the Jews. In, in John's gospel, the Jews is, are used in, in two ways. One is to describe the, the ethnic offspring of Abraham and Isaac. And the other, more prominent way, is to speak of the religious leaders of Israel in Jerusalem. So whenever you're reading through the Gospel of John and you see him talking about the Jews, you should probably assume that he's likely talking about the religious leaders uh, and not just ethnic offspring of, of, of Jews. And this is going to be important because throughout church history, some Christians have used uh, the rejection of the, the nation of Israel, and particularly the Jewish leaders rejecting Messiah as, as ways to advance uh, anti-Semitic sort of ideas. But that's, that's certainly not the, the gospel posture at all. I'm happy to talk with you more about that offline if you'd like. But these religious leaders, they have come because they've heard about John's revival at the river. Something's going on outside of town. There's a, there's a guy out there, and he's preaching, and there's all these crowds that are going out there to see him. So a delegation of the Pharisees, we see there in verse 25, part of the, the religious leaders, they, they send out a delegation to, to investigate. And their question for John the Baptist is, who are you? Or in Living Bible, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to be out here doing what you're doing? Now, on the one hand, this is an entirely appropriate and and necessary question. Religious leaders had been charged by God to oversee the spiritual uh, health of the nation. Their job was to uphold religious purity and, 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 and doctrinal orthodoxy. Truth is always under attack. It was no de- uh, different in this day. Josephus, who was a, uh, a Roman historian, uh, wrote about how during these days there was all sorts of, of kind of cult-like celebrities who were religious people who were drawing people and crowds after themselves claiming that they were the Messiah. So there was a lot of counterfeits messiahs in these days. So these religious leaders are working overtime trying to figure out who are all these people who are saying stuff and is John the Baptist another one of these crazy folk? So these, these leaders heard the buzz about the baptizer, and now they've come out to the revival at the river, and they say, who are you? Now, on the other hand, so the one hand is the good thing. They should be doing this. On the other hand, as we're going to see, most of the religious leaders of Jesus' day are far from being righteous themselves. We're going to meet a couple of them, so you're going to a guy named Nicodemus and a guy named Joseph of Arimathea who you're going to see are sensitive to, to, to Christ and are ultimately going to, going to trust him and follow him. But on the whole, 
the religious leaders of Jesus' day had hijacked the religion of Israel and turned it into a corrupt system of self-righteous, fear-mongering, that was marked by hypocrisy and spiritual abuse. And what they sought to do was to use religion to control people, to get people to, to admire them and get their money and all of their devotion and this kind of stuff. Which, just a side note, to be really clear, there's good religion and there's bad religion. So some people would just be like, oh, Christ, you know, following Jesus is not a religion. That's not true. You are all doing religious stuff right now. This is a religious gathering. That's why you're here. You're good at, we do religious stuff. Religion is not the problem. Religion is intended to facilitate and enhance a relationship with God. So good, relationship, good religion does that well. It, it speaks truth. It helps us to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness so our lives can honor God in everything we do. Bad religion distorts who God is and what God wants from people and aims to have other, other, me, other ends, taking money, controlling people, that kind of stuff. So don't, religion's not the problem. Hijacked religion is, which is part of the, the question here about John the baptizer. Who are you? Now, John knew that these guys were tripping. John knew that these religious leaders were not doing a good job, which is why, notice, where does it say John is doing this baptizing? Did you catch it there in verse 28? In Bethany across the Jordan, which is not where? Everywhere else. I know, but specifically, if, you, if there was going to be some sort of like religious gathering, where would you think it would be happening? In Jerusalem at the temple. But John says, uh-uh. If you're looking for Messiah... If you're looking for healthy religion, if you're looking how to be right with God, you can't go to the temple any longer. So you've got to come outside the city. You've got to come away from the temple. You've got to come away from the teachings there. You've got to come away from the sacrifices and the way they're doing it because things have become corrupt. He's calling them to come out from the corrupt system to prepare for another to prepare actually for what the entire system was intended to prepare you for, who is the Messiah. Messiah is coming. So they come and they ask, who are you? And John the Baptist is going to answer by giving three, this is who I'm not statements, followed by three, this is who I am statements. This is who I'm not, and this is who I, I am. So number one, he says, I am not the Christ. Verse 20 he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So, so the Christ, or the Messiah, is the deliverer that God has long promised all the way from days of, of Adam and Eve in the garden when, when humanity rebelled against God. God promised he would send a deliverer, and as time unfolded, he promised he would send that deliverer through the, the people of Israel, this deliverer who would come to rescue Jews and Gentiles alike, all people from sin and from suffering and from death and from judgment. And John the Baptist wants to be crystal clear on something. I'm not that guy. I'm not the Christ. And really, John's entire ministry, we'll see this later on in chapter 3 as well, his entire ministry is get the spotlight off of me and put it on Jesus. So he says, I am not the Christ. Number two, he says, I am not Elijah. I'm not Elijah. Verse uh, 21, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now, if you've read through the Old Testament before, you know this guy named Elijah. He was an Old Testament prophet who called Israel to turn or to repent from their idols and to worship God exclusively. That was his ministry. Well, the prophet Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi, um, he, anyway, he, he was he was the last prophet in the, in the uh, Old Testament besides John the Baptist. If you look at Matthew, right before him, you've got Malachi. Malachi ends his prophecy. The last word before he signs off is to say, Elijah is going to come and he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. Listen to this, Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Elijah is long expected in Israel. How many of you have ever been to a Passover, a Seder meal before? All right. 
you'll know that at the table, there's an empty chair. Who's it for? You hope Elijah going to show up. <laughs> like you're doing this Passover meal in anticipation. Ultimately, God gave it anticipation of the greater Passover lamb who's going to come. We'll meet him in a minute. But you set, a, you set a seat there in case Elijah shows up, which you're hoping he does, because this means Messiah's almost here. Well, John the Baptist says, I'm not Elijah. Now, more on that in a minute, because Jesus is later going to say he actually is Elijah, not re- Elijah reincarnated, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Number three, though, he says, I am also not the prophet. I'm not the prophet. 121, are you the prophet? He answered, no. This prophet is a reference to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where God says that he will, quote, I will raise up for the nation a prophet like Moses from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and whoever will not listen to my words that he speaks in my name, I myself will require it of him. John the Baptist says, that's not me either. Now, at the transfiguration, it's very interesting God the Father will use that same exact language about Jesus' Son. He will say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus actually is the fulfillment of the great prophet. He is the one who's raised up, who uh, God puts his words in and who speaks on behalf of, of God. So, John the Baptist has denied that he's the big three religious figures who you would expect would have the sort of authority to be doing the sort of things that John is doing out by the river. If this was the Christ, it would make sense. If this was Elijah, it would make sense. If this was the prophet, it would make sense. So, verse 22, they say, all right, well then, who are you? We know who you're not, buddy, but like, we've got to give answers to the guys who sent us. Who, what do you say about yourself? Why are you baptizing, verse 25, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Who do you think you are? Who's given you this authority to be out here calling people to do this? We can't go back empty-handed. You've got to give us some answers. So he says, I'll tell you who I am. And now he's going to give the three, this is, this is who I am. So we've had who I'm not, and now he's going to say who he is. One, I am a warning voice, or I'm a preparing voice. I'm a voice, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So John the Baptist isn't the word, but he is a voice witnessing about the word. And you'll notice there he's he's quoting this from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which begins an entire section in Isaiah, side note, commercial for the prophet Isaiah. As we're studying through the book of John, I encourage you to be reading through the prophet Isaiah. Take a chapter a day or a half a chapter a day. Of all of the things that John quotes, Exodus and Isaiah are all over the place. John, is con- John the Apostle is constantly drawing from the, the work in, in the book of Exodus and Isaiah. And the better you understand the Old Testament, the better you understand what's happening in the New Testament. So if you're thinking, what should I be reading through? There you go, Exodus and Isaiah. Anyway, back to this. Isaiah chapter 40 through 46 is a section that announces the good news that the Lord is coming to deliver his people from sin and from suffering and from shame and to enter uh, or to usher them into a new heaven and a new earth. Well, this Isaiah chapter 40 announces a forerunner for the king of glory. And John the Baptist says, that's me. I am announcing, I'm I'm the forerunner for the king of glory who's coming. I'm preparing the way for his arrival. I'm calling everybody to remove everything that's going on in their lives, everything that's going on in their hearts, all the sins that would hinder them from receiving Messiah, I'm calling them to turn from that. Now, in in Old Testament times, if a, a king's forerunner, what they would do is they would go ahead of a king and they would, they would level out the roads, they would take out the big bumps, uh, they would cut back the, the branches, all that kind of stuff, so you have a smooth ride. And then he would send messengers ahead to the towns along the way and say, hey, y'all need to prepare because the king's going to be rolling through pretty soon, and you guys need to be ready to give him a, a warm welcome. So anything you need to do, get ready. Mow your grass, get your, you know, do some mulching, all the kind of stuff you got to do, be ready for, for the king. 
John says, that's what I'm doing spiritually. I'm, I'm helping people prepare for Messiah who's about to show up. So I just think a, a word of application for us here. If you knew Jesus were coming tomorrow or tonight, is there anything that you would need to change to be ready? Is there anything left undone that you know he's been calling you to do? Is there anything that you've been doing that you know I need to repent of this? Is there any forgiveness that you've been withholding? And any secret sins that you've not been confessing and repenting of? Any gospel conversations left uninitiated with people that you deep down know that you need to talk to? Well, the reality is, Jesus says we should always be ready for his return because he could come at any moment. And even this morning, John the Baptist's call for the nation to be ready, I think should resonate in our hearts that we might think, what do I need to do be, to be ready as well? So I encourage you to talk about that over lunch. Ask that question to one another. Is there anything that you need to do to be ready? He says, I'm a warning voice, or I'm a wooing voice, or a preparing voice. I'm also, number two, I am a baptizer. I am a baptizer. Verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water. So other gospels inform us that John was baptizing people in, in the Jordan River. Matthew 3, Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So John is doing this bapti baptizing. Now, baptism in the Old Testament was different than the way we think about it today. It was an act of ritual cleansing. So this is something that was, was going on that was done by an individual to themselves as they prepared to worship. So if you were, say, a proselyte, somebody converted from another religion to, Jeru uh, to, um, to, uh, to worship the God of Israel, or if you had needed to offer some sort of sacrifice uh, to cleanse yourself from sin, you would, on the way into the temple, there were pools up there that you would get in and you would dip yourself and you would symbolically cleanse yourself. So you would baptize yourself. Well, John here is doing something totally different. He was baptizing people. He, 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 what, this is revolutionary. He was declaring, hey, you need to be cleansed and you can't do it yourself. You need somebody outside of you to help you. You need somebody to do for you what you can't do for yourself. So align yourself with the message of the coming king because he's got what you need. He, he was claiming God-given authority to call people to turn and to prepare. This is, by the way, why baptism is, is tied to authority. So, so for John to do this, he couldn't just, you can't just go out and just baptize anybody you want. Why? Because baptism is not yours. It's God's. The, the, the gift of, that it, the pictures of repentance and forgiveness, this is God's. He gave it to John the Baptist to prepare for Jesus. Now Jesus gives it to his church. He, he, gives, he gives it to the authority to the church. And now we baptize in the name of, of Christ. It's an act of public repentance that says, this doesn't save me, but it aligns me with the one who does. Jesus himself. John says, that's what I'm about. I'm a baptizer. Number three, I'm a servant. Verse 26, among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. This image of untying a, a sandal strap, this is part of the job description of, of a servant in this day. So when a master would come home and bring guests, a, a servant or a couple servants would, would greet at the door, and after a long day of walking on the dusty paths, uh, they would sit down, and the servant would, would welcome them by untying their, their sandal straps and washing their feet. John the Baptist here says, listen, I'm, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals that this man wears. This is how much more glorious he is than me. So, so I'm a servant, but I'm an unworthy servant. By the way, this is why John 13 and the scene of Jesus 
washing the disciples' feet is so amazing. That God would humble himself, not just by taking on flesh, but stooping to wash the feet of the disciples who with those very same clean feet would run off and deny him. Jesus is the servant of servants. John the Baptist says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm just a servant of the Lord, but I'm an unworthy servant. I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. Now, I just want to pause here, because when I, when I thought about that idea of being a, an unworthy servant, I was reminded of a, a particular saint uh, among us who, for years, has been plagued with something that a lot of people feel. And that's the unworthiness of being a Christian. They, they, they feel like they have a hard time coming to God and praying. They have a hard time coming to His Word, because they constantly are aware of how guilty they are and how... And their shame hinders them from coming to, 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 to Christ. I just want to point out here, John feels that unworthiness as well. Authentic Christians have a sense of unworthiness to be Christians. So I want you to know that if you feel that way, you're actually on the right path. You have the right posture. Nobody struts into the house of the Lord. Nobody struts up to the Lord's Supper. Nobody, nobody struts in the kingdom of God. We are all unworthy servants. And it's actually that, that sense of unworthiness that makes us able to receive the mercy that Jesus loves to give. I just want to read a quote from Frederick Bruner. He's uh, written a commentary on the Gospel of John that so far I've been encouraged by. He says this, It is those who are overwhelmed with Christ who are undergirded by him. Those who sense their unworthiness are exactly those credited with his worthiness, with the reckoned righteousness before the righteous God who gives the gift. Those who know themselves unworthy are precisely those considered worthy of receiving his mercy. The only requirement that God has of you to receive grace is to know you need grace. To come and to say, I have nothing to bring. I am a beggar. I need you, O bread of life. This is your hope. This is why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist was poor in spirit. He said, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals of the one who is coming. So, John the Baptist answered to the Jews of who are you? He said, I am a prophet sent from God as a, as a voice warning and preparing the Messiah's coming. I'm baptizing in water as symbolic of the cleansing that he's going to give. And I have come to serve the Christ who is coming. I'm an unworthy servant. Now, before we move on and look just a little bit more about who Jesus is, I think, I think it's helpful for us to just draw a little bit of, of application here on on what it means for us to be faithful witnesses and how John the Baptist teaches us that. So, just as John the Baptist said, I am not the Christ, it's good for us to know who we are and who we aren't. You and I are not the Christ. We're also not John the Baptist, okay? But you do have to know who you are. If you are born again, if you have turned from your sin and you have trusted in Christ, you are, number one, a child of God. You're a child of God if you are in Christ. John 1.12, all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That means, who are you as his witness? You are his beloved, forgiven child, whom he loves. So you serve from a posture of being loved, not trying to earn it or deserve it. This is who you are. Secondly, you are a witness of Christ. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses to testify of Jesus' death and resurrection and soon return. And though we were not there to see him resurrected from the dead, we know he is alive. How? Because he has met us by grace through faith, and he has made you alive in him. And so we witness of his grace. And you, that does not mean you have to have all of the answers to everybody's questions. But you begin to share 
what Christ has done in your life, and you share who he is and what he has done. You witness to him. If you are a Christian, you're able to do that. You're a child of God. You're a witness of God. And thirdly, you are a gifted member of Christ's body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, every believer has been baptized with the Holy Spirit and gifted. Not everybody can do everything that everybody else can do. John the Baptist knew who he wasn't. But if you're a child of God, we follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist. We're beloved children of God who are here to witness about Jesus. He has given us everything we need to do that by the power of his spirit. So go humbly, but go boldly. Witness with bold humility. I just want to read one more quote here that I found really helpful about this idea of of not being the Christ. This is from Zach Eswine's book called Imperfect Pastor. Um, Really helpful book if you desire to be in ministry. Just, I mean, I think generally helpful for Christians. He says, there's a freedom in admitting our limitations. We get to follow John the Baptist's footsteps and say, I am not the Christ. It means I don't have to know everything. I don't have to fix everything. And I'm not expected to be everywhere at once. That means you don't have to be what only Jesus can be for people. You don't have to bear what only Jesus can bear for people. You don't have to do for people what only Jesus can do for them. You and I can't fix other people. We can't fix ourselves, nor can we fix other people. All we can do is point them to Jesus and haul all that he can do for them. That is tremendously liberating if you allow it to be. You are not the Christ. I am not the Christ. Some of us are tempted to be. We try and control people. We try and control situations. We try to fix everything. John would just say, hey, that's not your job. You are freed from that. You are not the Christ. Your job is to point to the Christ and to follow the Christ and to allow him to do the changing. One other thing is, as I alluded to, is that sometimes, for those who are serving Christ as witnesses of Christ, you don't realize actually how God is working through you. You remember that John the Baptist said that he wasn't Elijah? Well, Jesus actually said that he is. Matthew chapter 11, if you are willing to accept it, this is Jesus speaking, John the Baptist is Elijah who is to come. See, John John didn't even realize that he was actually fulfilling the the, the role of Elijah foretold by the prophet Malachi. John actually was tempted to even wonder if Jesus, you know, if he'd missed something about Jesus because he was in prison about to die. And Jesus sent word to him to comfort him. The reason I think that's important is because so often, for those of us who are trying to faithfully walk with the Lord and trying to serve We could be unaware that God is actually doing more in us than we think he is. A lot of times we just, we want immediate results. We want to see somebody's life change. Like they're they're having a hard time and we meet with them and we want to just have the verse that like, I said the verse and they're like, I've never thought of that. My entire life has changed. It just doesn't work like that typically. I mean, occasionally. If that happens for you all the time, come and talk to us. We'd love to, uh, we have an idea of how to use you. But like that's just not, that's just not what happens, Okay. I mean, it rarely happens that way. The Lord's always at work, but always very slowly. And most of the way that we will see how the fruit of the the gospel seeds were sown and the hard relationships and how he was working and all of that won't be until the last day. Remember Jesus talking about the, the last day and the judgment? He'll say, people will be like, when do we do all these things for you? And he said, and then he will tell them when, and they'll be like, I didn't even see it. But he saw it. So remember that God is at work, and our job is to witness with humble boldness like John the Baptist. All right, now, verse 29. Who I'm not, this is who I am. Let me tell you about Jesus. He's going to magnify the person of Jesus. Verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, 
that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But when he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have bore witness that this is the Son of God. These guys are asking, John, who are you? I'll tell you who I am. I'll tell you who I'm not. But let me tell you who he is. Because the most important thing you can know about me, John would say, is him. John was going about this this business of baptizing people in preparation for the coming Messiah. And then these ultimate, you know, these guys come, and they're like, who is he? And they're like, listen, he's the one you're looking for. He's the one we've been praying for. He's, He's the one we've been longing for. Jesus himself. John reveals or testifies about three realities about Jesus. He's the Lamb of God, he gives the Spirit of God, and he is the Son of God. John says, let me tell you, who I am doesn't matter. Who he is. He is the Lamb of God. Verse 29, number one, he's the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John says, that's who he is. This is one of the most compact and powerful descriptions of Jesus and his ministry in all of Scripture. Lambs have been present throughout the Old Testament, playing a a, a vital role in the spiritual life of, of God's people. They are a substitute for sinners. Their blood is shed in the place of sinners. Because when somebody sins against a holy God, somebody's gonna pay for it. The wages of sin is death. God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. Sinning against a holy God, because he's good, he will bring justice. It brings death. Somebody's got to die. Well, God gives these these substitutes as kind of placeholders until the ultimate substitute comes. That's what a lamb's role was. Some people think that's actually the, when Adam and Eve, after they sinned, you remember they put uh, fig leaves on? Well, those fig leaves were then rem- removed, and there were skins of an animal placed on them. Some believe that was an, a lamb. We have no idea. But, but it's, the picture is the same. That whatever ways we try and hide and cover up our, our, our sin and shame, God says, that's not going to do. What I provide for you is what you need. Well, in Abraham's day, lambs were offered to God uh, as sacrifice. And you remember when, God was take, or when Abraham was t- taking Isaac up to sacrifice him, Isaac asked, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? To which Abraham replied, God will provide for himself the lamb. And it's really ever since that that the question of where is this lamb? Where is this lamb? Who will this lamb be? that it's echoed all the way through Scripture. We heard one of the places that it echoed uh, when the Scripture was read this morning from Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, that God instituted this this religious act where, by faith, Israel would take a, a, a spotless lamb and they would sacrifice it, and then they would take the blood from that lamb and put it on the door of their home, and by faith, they would hide under the blood of the lamb. And anybody who, by faith, would hide under the blood of the lamb the death angel would pass over and judgment would not fall upon that house. Where is this lamb? Who is this lamb? Well, you have the Passover lamb. And then throughout the offerings uh, of Israel, Exodus 29 talks about this, there was a daily, daily offering of a lamb, both in the morning and the evening, to cover the sins of the people. If you read through the Old Testament, there's blood everywhere, lamb after lamb after lamb. And it's like thousands upon thousands of lambs blood shed again and again and again, echoing, I think, where is the lamb? Who is the lamb? When would he come? Who's the lamb? Who's the lamb? Who's the lamb? And then John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of those sacrifices, they were all in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice, of the one who would come and be the final sacrifice for sinners. This is he who would come and die, who would shed his blood as the final offering to cover the sin of sinners once and for all. 
This is the one foretold in the prophet Isaiah, who would be pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all, like a lamb led to a slaughter. This is the Lamb of God, he says. And he points to him. He points to Jesus, the one who came to take away the sins of the world. This was Jesus' duty. It was his destiny. It was his desire. It was why he came. Hebrews 9.26, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus came as the Lamb of God. And John the Baptist is calling people to repent of their sins and to be forgiven. And now he says, let me show you how that forgiveness is possible. God does not just forgive because he's nice. That makes him a wicked God. So any God who will forgive just because he can or just because he will, he's not, he can't be good. Why? Because justice must be served. If there's a God who will just shrug off sins and say, well, I'm nice, I'm going to forgive, that's not a good God. A good God requires blood. He requires, there, there must be justice. And the lamb of bulls and goats, they don't equate to, to human rebellion. They're, 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 the book of Hebrews will say that they were, they were reminders of sin. So what Jesus does, this is why he's the God-man, fully God, fully man, so he can fully represent us. He comes as the Lamb of God, the, the, the perfect human who had no sin, who could die in the place of sinners like you and me. The Lamb came to take away the guilt of sin by washing away our sin with his precious, perfect, sinless blood. He came, 1 John 2, 2, to be the propitiation, the satisfaction of wrath, the justice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you hear that? Jesus came to, to die in the place for your sins, if you will have him. But not just yours, but for everyone who will turn from their sins and trust in him. Every people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. In him there is hope. He is the final sacrifice for, for sinners. Matthew Henry says, <laughs> I love this. This is encouraging to our faith, that Jesus is the propiti or the, the sacrifice for, for, uh, for the world that he takes away the sin of the world. This is encouraging to our faith. If Christ takes away the sin of the world, then why not my sin? If indeed Jesus' blood is great enough to atone for the, 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 the sins of the world, he can cover yours. Some of you feel so riddled with shame and guilt because of all of the things that you've done, and Jesus would say, my blood is sufficient to wash you clean. No matter how deep that stain is, how dark that stain is, he can wash you clean and make you white as snow and forgive you. This is why he says, behold the lamb. Behold him. Behold the one who climbed Calvary and there on the cross took the justice that we deserve, the judgment that we deserve. He, the spotless lamb, died in our place and went in the grave and then he rose now as the victorious lamb, able to save. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The lamb of God satisfied the justice of God and rose to give us the mercy of God. Seeing Jesus as the Lamb of God is intended to move us to love him and to hate our sin. It's intended to move us to see this one who would give himself to undeserving people like you and me and to make us see the, the, the sin that we're so tempted to love as, as such a betrayer and a traitor of every good thing that God has for us. It's intended to make us love him and hate our sin. So, so let us not hold that which the Lamb of God came to take away. Don't hold on to your sin and say, no, but I love this sin. Jesus came to take it away, to take away the sin of the world and to take away your sin. Plead with God to increase your love for him. For, Revelation 1.5, him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Ask God to help you to foresee by faith the day mentioned in Revelation 7, 14, 
where we will stand and be called those who, quote, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And there in that place, it says that the Lamb is in the midst of the throne and will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus came as the Lamb of God to shed his blood, to set you free, to forgive you, and to usher you into the new heaven and the new earth where sin and shame and guilt will be no more. John says that's who he is. He's the Lamb of God. He's also, secondly, he gives the Spirit of God. John says that Jesus has the Holy Spirit and he gives the Holy Spirit. Verse 32, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. He's describing the scene of Jesus' baptism. We see that in other Gospels, that, that, that Jesus was baptized uh, by John. John was a little reluctant about it. He's like, actually, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, no, this is to fulfill all righteousness. Not meaning that Jesus had sin that he needed to repent of, but rather Jesus was aligning with the message that John the Baptist was preaching of, hey, the kingdom's coming. And when it happened, do you remember, when Jesus was baptized, do you remember what happened? Heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit came like a dove on him and remained on him. Not some kind of temporary filling like in the Old Testament, but rather a permanent anointing. But you can read more about that in Isaiah 11, 42, and 61, where Messiah, the Spirit, will come upon him to empower. And you remember that John heard a voice of God the Father. He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So the baptism that John gives is in water, but it's a mere shadow of the baptism that Jesus gives, which is the Holy Spirit. And again, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, when you hear that Jesus is the one who's going to give the Spirit, you're like, this is too good to be true. So not only is he the Lamb who takes away my sin, but he's now the giver of the Spirit. The Spirit is the seal of the new covenant where, where, where God says, I will give you, Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put in you. I will remove the heart of stone from you and give you a heart of flesh, echoing that same promise Jeremiah 31, they will all know me, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So when Jesus is the giver of the Spirit, this means he's ushering us into the, the new covenant where God, God remembers our sins no more. No more. Some of you who can only remember your sins and you look back on your life and all you can see are all the ways that you've sinned against him. In Christ, blood has been shed, you are washed, and now, God does not deal with you with your sins deserve. What that means is that on the day of judgment, when the books are opened and all of the deeds of everything you've ever done are laid bare before the eyes of the all-knowing God, and judgment happens, if you're in Christ, when it begins to read through your life, all of the things that were against you, they won't be there. Why? Because they're covered with blood. And the Spirit of God seals that and assures that it happened. And he will remember your sins no more. And all that will remain will be the evidence of God's spirit working in you with the good works that he worked by his grace. This is good news that Jesus is the Lamb of God and the giver of the spirit of God. And that he is also finally, verse 34, the Son of God. I have seen and have bore witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist declares that Jesus is, is no mere man. He is a man, but he's the God-man. Uh, look again at verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. John was physically born before Jesus, but Jesus existed before John. How could this riddle be true? Well, it's only possible if... John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. John the Baptist knew that Jesus was the Son of God because at the baptism the Father declared it. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So John the Baptist says, You've come out to ask who I am and what I'm doing? Listen, I'm, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. Even though I am, I don't know it. I'm not the prophet. I'm a voice. And I'm warning. 
And I, I'm warning that you need to turn from your sin and prepare because Messiah is coming. So be baptized in this symbol of, of cleansing that's going to point you toward the cleansing that, that he's going to do. Because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the giver of the Spirit of God that will seal all who turn from their sin and trust in him. Seal till the day of redemption. And God will deal them no longer according to their sins. And he is the very Son of God in whom the Father is well pleased. And if you will humble yourself and be found in him, the Father will say the same of you. Behold, Justin, in whom I'm well pleased. Behold, Sarah, in whom I am well pleased. Behold, whatever your name is, if you are in Christ, he sees you as he sees Christ. And he loves you in spite of everything. Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb, the Spirit giver, and the very Son of God. Now after this, the religious leaders are going to go back, and most of them are not going to be believing. This is actually going to tick them off. And the rest of the book is going to begin to unfold the drama of them trying to find ways to kill him, to shut this Jesus up. They're going to take off John the Baptist's head at some point so that he can't testify anymore. And they're going to do whatever they can to get this Jesus guy on a cross rather than humble themselves and believe. Which brings it back to you. This is the first of the encounters that John the author presents after telling us who Jesus is. It's intended to humble you and to say, well, then if all of this is true about Jesus, then I want to believe like John the Baptist did. So, if you're here today and you know yourself to not be a Christian, I know a lot of this sounds confusing. If there's something that God gave you that you hear about the, the preciousness of Jesus dying for a sinner like you, hold on to that. We will help walk this out and talk more about some of the things that you've heard today. I want you to know, though, it's not by accident that you're here. He wants you to come and to be forgiven. And if you are a Christian, this gospel would call us to come and to believe afresh. Like John the Baptist, to be amazed at this spirit-giving, grace-giving, blood-shedding Savior who would come for sinners like you and me. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you who he, for who he is, the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, Father, would you help those of us who, who know him to be faithful ministers of this gospel truth, that we would humbly admit who we are, but that we would hopefully point to who he is. And would you give us grace? And Lord, even now as we prepare to take this, this supper, this reminder of Jesus, would you show us afresh the preciousness of these elements and how they reflect the body and the blood given for us. Help us to behold the Lamb of God. In the name of Christ.